Good morning. Um, yesterday, in Tabeleng Lichotzi of YWBA, Young Women in Business Network, um, I think proposed or pitched to try and raise 5 billion rand um, into a potential bank. Um, uh, a, 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 a quite an important, quite a famous uh, uh, Tweleb huh, a guy on Twitter, Koshik Karan, decided to blast her and asked her a lot of questions and apparently she struggled um, and she got dragged and a lot of people got dragged um, on Twitter yesterday. So I just decided to make this video just to try and offer my opinion on, on what I think went down and what's trying to happen for a lot of people that don't really understand. Um, just a bit of background. I've worked for two of the biggest banks in the country. This doesn't mean, <laughs> this doesn't mean that I know banking. You know, uh, I used to sing in choirs at school and I used to tell people that just because you sing in a choir doesn't mean you're a good singer. You know, similarly, I, work, I worked in banking. doesn't necessarily mean that I know banking. Um, I did my Bachelor of Commerce um, in Accounting and Economics from Rhodes University. And I did my Honours in Accounting at the University of Johannesburg. This by no means makes me qualified to speak on what I'm trying to speak on now. What does qualify me, I believe, is the fact that I've read up on the history of banking from... The Ascent of Money by Neil Ferguson. I've read Banking 3.0. Uh, I forget the author now. Um, I've read up on um, cooperative, cooperative financial institutions, CFIs. I've read up on mutual banks. I've read up on um, retail banks and investment banks. Um, and I've read many, many articles on banking, how, how to build a bank. Read some of the Banking Act from the South African Reserve Bank. Etc. So I think that qualifies me to have some type of opinion, not because I worked in banking and not because I have a commerce qualification. South Africa's history comes from a lot of cooperatives. Cooperatives is a fancy white word for actually a stock fell, but a more formal one. It's a group of people that come together and decide to either pool funds or pool resources for the benefit of the whole. If you look at a company like Clover, started off with a group of farmers coming together and deciding to pull their milk and wholesale it and then ultimately retail it together. If you look at a company like Afkri, it was a bunch of Afrikaans farmers that came together that were grain farmers and decided to bring their grain together, put it in silos and then sell it wholesale once again. We can see the same with APSA today. It used to be Falskas before it merged with three other banks. Falskas was a cooperative where a bunch of Afrikaans people came together and said, we want our own bank. And they built it like a stock firm. The difference, obviously, between a corporation, a cooperative, um, and a stock fell is the formalization aspect of it. But essentially, it's the same thing. Mutual banks follow on from cooperatives where you need a certain amount of directors. You need a certain amount of money that they've put in. And you need shared responsibility um, and liability um, with all of those members, all of those directors, all of those found founders of that mutual bank. Ntabeleng and her group of people have done really great work. I think over the last five years or six years, I'm not really sure. They've managed to raise about 21 million rand uh, with 600 members, pushing this narrative of black people want to own their own bank. It's time black people own their own bank. And uh, people have been very excited. A couple of months ago, she announced that the South African Reserve Bank had finally given them an authorization to get a banking license. Huge celebration. Fortunately, people don't really understand the process. From there, what's meant to happen? Because Discovery Bank, Zero Bank, Time Bank had to go through the same processes. Once the South African Reserve Bank, you've met some of the base criteria. From then, you need to prove that you have the, the resources to put up infrastructure, to have offices, maybe get ATMs, um, maybe have IT infrastructure, the computers, the know-how, the, the skilled staff, etc., to be able to run a bank before they officially offer you a full license. That's very important. A full mutual banking license because there are different types of licenses. The mutual banking one is at the lowest end. Retail is much tougher. Investment banking, I think, is arguably as tough as the retail bank. A lot of the banks that you guys know today, Capitec, uh, I believe Investec as well, they, they didn't apply for licenses they bought existing licenses because the process is so, so difficult and it keeps people out. Currently, as it stands, I stand to be corrected, but I think you need at least 260 million rand 
sitting, just money that will sit as reserves just to begin the process of applying for a normal retail banking license. That's why the mutual banking licenses is the easier route to take with the hope that over time, the mutual bank will have enough money and enough credibility and enough products to be able to then graduate and become a retail bank. So on Tabiling are currently busy with, with that process and they're trying to raise 5 billion rand. So Koshik had issues because his issue was you're trying to raise 5 billion rand for a bank that doesn't exist, uh, for a bank that doesn't currently have products and you're telling people that they will be shareholders. However, you'll only be offering them 44% of shares of this new potential bank, whereas the rest of you guys are coming in with only 21 million and you're going to be owning 56%. Of the bank sounds like rubbish sounds like a scam sounds like a scheme etc a couple of people offered their thoughts a lot of people were dragging tabeleng and her team uh, some people were cheering her on because they know the process she's been documenting it on twitter and other platforms for people to see i'd like to think some of the banks that i mentioned discovery time zero they had people that were bankrolling the bank at the at the back end your patrice mutipe adrian go and discovery as a medical aid scheme helped um the Discovery Bank, and then Zero Bank comes from Michael Jordan, who used to be the CEO of FNB. <clears throat> he's currently a venture capitalist, and he's got a lot of people that have deep pockets that invest in him and, and what he does. On Tabileng, unfortunately, don't have this privilege, unless if they could get a, a Patrice, a Cyril, a anybody else who's a, a billionaire and who can give them this money. They now need to try and raise funding, either from the public, which is very difficult, um, or from funding agencies such as the PIC, uh, maybe the NAF, um, maybe the IDC, for example. So the big issue here is the people won't see any returns for the first six years if they're lucky. That's kind of normal, especially if you look at these new BEE shares that have been introduced. They have a lock-in period, normally of about five years, some have 10 years, where you can't trade, you don't get dividends, you don't get anything. You know, so that's very normal. And a lot of people that don't understand business, if you're starting up a business, it's very normal that the money you put in initially won't start yielding returns. The reason there are so many Ponzi schemes and permit schemes and scams is because everyone says, put in money and from the first month, you'll start getting returns. And when you're building a real business, it's, it's literally like farming. I can't ask you for money to plant seeds and then tell you from the first month, we'll be making cash. That's very difficult. And it means the farm probably won't really grow probably won't really have infrastructure. So that part is, is, is not that big a deal that people won't get returns. The second problem is the fact that most of this money will be going to infrastructure to begin with. And Koshik's issue, which is very valid, is why are you getting people to fund this infrastructure for you? Meanwhile, you're going to be getting a bigger chunk of the shares. And that's something that Ntabiling unfortunately um, struggles to, to articulate and answer very properly. And the hope is that over time, people will either buy in and say, look, build the infrastructure, it's fine. Or is there some other way that you guys can share the risk with us? Because you guys are only bringing 21 million. We're going to be bringing in over, over 4 billion. And yet you guys want the lion's share of the shares. You know, There's no guarantee that the bank will work. There's no guarantee that they'll be able to raise the 5 billion. We don't currently know if what the minimum is. Do they really need 5 billion or do they maybe need 1 billion? Do they maybe need 500 million? We don't really know. What happens if they manage to raise a billion, two billion? Do they call off? Um, do they call off the building of the bank? Will they use the money to maybe build an investment fund that will maybe one day graduate into a bank, uh, or will they give people back their money? If they give people back their money, will they give them back the full um, full amounts that people put in, or will they say, look, since we've used some of your money to do some of these other things, unfortunately you've lost that money, so we can only pay you back what's left which is part of the risk of investing, unfortunately. You can buy shares in any company. And look, Steinhoff is the worst example, but a lot of other companies have really bad financial years or they crash or they close and people lose their money. It's part of the risk of trading. It's part of the risk of investing, unfortunately. There's, there's really sensitive sentiments around a black bank because human beings, and specifically in South Africa, people believe banks are the cornerstone of the economy, the backbone of the economy. And because black people don't own banks, this is why black people are highly excluded from the economy. The story of Dr. Sam Mutsuenyane and a couple of other guys that started African Bank, which eventually got bought out by Jews and turned into a, lo a, loan, a loans business, a loans bank, kind of crashed because of greed. 
And then from there, it was taken over by, by our biggest banks, who I believe operate mostly as a cartel. Cartel means a couple of big companies come together and then make, this, make agreements to put prices at a certain level, make agreements to come together to the regulators and make sure that they keep other people out. It's illegal. It's not allowed. But I'd like to think that our banks operate like a cartel. If you look at where our banks come from, they didn't need 260 million when they were first setting up. But today, they've made the barrier to entry so high to keep out people. From their side, they argue that it's to protect consumers, to so make sure that the bank that's coming in is, is cash, cash flow positive, has got reserves, etc. And it's in the interest of the consumers. But the truth of the matter is that it's really, really in the interest of the big banks and the big banks' shareholders. And people may know or may not know, but your Tokyo Sehwale Turim Vela Panda used to own a chunk of EPSA. Uh, so Ramaphosa, the current president, used to, I'd like to think, either be a board member or the chairman of Standard Bank. Um, at some point, uh, one of his close BEE friends, uh, Saki Matozo, I think used to be the, the, the chairman of either Standard Bank or Stand Lab or Liberty. But all of these guys operate in the same space. And they've got these big politicians and these big, big players White businessmen, white politicians, black politicians, black businessmen who come and sit on these boards and make sure that they keep people out. So the whole story of banks is very emotional. My argument, unfortunately, is that black banks are not the solution for black people. Firstly, I'd like to state, even though it's largely controlled by Absa Bank, Itala Bank in KZN is a black bank. U Bank, which I think used to be called, I think, Perm Bank, um, that came from the mines. That's a black-owned bank. Um, Time Bank today, owned by Patrice Motsipa, is seen as a black bank, even though I think that's very dodgy. It was brought in by Australians. They couldn't really get all the green lights, so then they decided to apparently sell their shares, all their shares to Patrice Motsipa. So that's apparently a black bank. If people keep talking about state-owned banks, Post Bank is a state-owned bank. It's owned by our government. A land bank uh, is a bank owned by the government. All these banks are mentioning black people are not putting their money in. Black people are not screaming about. Black people are not making efforts to take these, to take this infrastructure and these banks and then catapult them to becoming the banks that they want. Which tells me that this whole thing of black bank is just noise and rhetoric and mostly for campaigning from some of political parties like the EFF at some point the ANC talking about we need our own state owned banks. We need black banks. These things exist and people are not using them. That tells me that people are not really serious about solutions. And it makes sense why Untabelin was being dragged because people are just constantly waiting for another black um, initiative to crash. Sadly, we've got the vendor building uh, society, VBS Bank, which went and fucked up people's monies, unfortunately. So black banks currently have a bad rep because of what VBS did, even though it had political interference. They gave a loan to Jacob Zuma, uh, Julius Malim and Floyd Shibambu somehow were connected to the people that ran the bank. So... It's a mess, unfortunately. I don't think banks are the solution. Why? Every bank that's going to operate in South Africa has to bow down to the South African Reserve Bank. The South African Reserve Bank is our central bank. It's apparently independent, which I think is a pile of nonsense. People like Tito Mboweni, Pravin Kordan, a couple of other people and a lot of foreigners own shares in the South African Reserve Bank. Apparently, this means that they have no control. It has to be objective. Things are still transparent and open. But unfortunately, I don't think that this is true. They don't get much dividends from this bank, but they do have some of a say of how the bank operates. They obviously work with the uh, monetary policy in government to make sure that they, re they, they, they tweak interest rates, which then affect our money supply in this country to try and control inflation and deflation and the value of our currency compared to other currencies across the world. If you just go crazy and you print money, you get what's called hyperinflation, which is what happened in Zimbabwe. The rest of the world says you guys are crazy. You guys can't print money like you're crazy. And they devalued the Zim dollar, which today is largely worthless. <laughs> Funny enough, the Federal Reserve in America does the exact same thing. But because the world is large, largely run on the American dollar, Americans get to do whatever they want. And the rest of us just keep quiet and agree to anything they, they say. They have, I think, the most millionaires. Today, we've got cryptocurrency that's trying to counter some of this bogus money printing and, and, and fooling around with global monetary systems by these central banks. And they're hoping that cryptocurrency is a solution, which I don't think is a solution, but I'll, I'll make another video about that 
in time because I think blockchain is 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 a fugazi. I don't think it's it's real. And if you look at what Elon Musk has done with his tweets, he's proven to me, and I hope to some people in the world, that Bitcoin, cryptocurrency, Ethereum, and all these other uh, currencies are not as transparent and independent and stable as people claim that they are. So the banks have to bow down to the South African Reserve Bank. South African Reserve Bank bows down to the Central Bank of London, which has built the template for central banks around the world. Central Bank of London, I'd like to think, is the biggest central bank or the most respected central bank in the world. It was founded by, amongst others, one of the kids of the Rothschilds. Big headquarters are in Switzerland, but no one really talks about that because those are conspiracy theories. You had the father Rothschild who had five sons, spread his five sons across Europe, and they set up banks. And the most important one became the Central Bank of London, which set the template for central banks across the world, including South Africa. If you're a bank, you have to buy, bow to the South African Reserve Bank. That means you can't do whatever you want. Additionally, if you're offering loans, you have to abide to the National Credit Regulator, the NCR. The NCR tells you what you can loan out at what rate, at what fee, based on what criteria. There's something called reckless lending. That's when you're giving someone too much money than they can afford, or you're giving them money even though their, their risk profile is very high. And when those people can't pay you back, the person that can't pay you back and go to the NCR and say, look, I don't know why these people gave me money and you can get in trouble and you can get your NCR license revoked. Similarly, you can get your banking license revoked if you don't abide by the South African Reserve Bank's guidelines. What does this mean? This means that any new black bank will not operate much differently from any white bank. Whatever criteria that white banks use, the black bank will have to use as well. Otherwise, they will have their banking license revoked. They will have their NCR loaning license revoked. That's why I do not believe that black banks are the solution for black people. If black people want to play in the economy, they need to start taking their money and buying from black stores. The Pakistanis today keep most of their resources in their spaza shops. Every time their spaza shop gets full, they then open another spaza shop. Every time it gets full, they open another one. They don't majorly bank their money. They don't leave cash lying around. They invest their resources in their stock and they grow from there. If black people want to build, they need to buy from black businesses. Those black businesses need to buy from black suppliers. Those black suppliers need to buy from black farmers or black manufacturers. And that's how black people will then gain a chunk of the economy. Indians are doing it in South Africa. The Chinese are doing it in South Africa. Afrikaans people have been doing it in South Africa. The Jewish people are doing it in South Africa. Black people are struggling and they think their solution is voting ANC, voting EFF, or building a black bank. Those are not the solutions. And until black people unlock their minds, until they get psychological, uh, a psychological shift in their spending patterns, until they understand the cash flow and the money system and the banking models of, the, of this world, they will not make it. You will get a black bank. It will be owned by some of the big BEE guys that are out there today. It will operate just like any white bank. Those black people become multimillionaires or billionaires and the banks will still keep black people majorly out because you guys lack financial education. You don't know how to put together funding packs. You don't understand risk. You don't understand affordability. You don't bank your money. You don't audit your financial statements. You don't even create financial statements and then you magically expect to get money. Unfortunately, the game and the system that we're in doesn't allow that. System has been built to favor certain people, people that are educated, people that understand it. And unfortunately, the people that run this system, they shift the, goal, the goalposts whenever they see a certain group beginning to emerge and win. We see this in, in universities today. We've got a 40% black graduate unemployment problem. We were told at some point that getting a degree is what will help you get a good job. Black people went and did that. And then from their companies shifted. Now it's not just about a degree. Now it's about experience. Now it's about who you know. Now it's about which university did you go to. Which high school did you go to? Which old boys club do you belong to? So the goalposts are constantly being shifted and black people unfortunately are sleeping and they don't understand these things. What do I suggest? Besides buying from businesses that make sense to you, buying from black businesses because you want to build a black economy, the next important thing is to set up stock files. Find a group of people, put in 100 rand, 500 rand, 1,000 rand, 5,000 rand, 10,000 rand a month. Accumulate money as a group. There can be five of you, 10 of you, 100 of you have regular meetings, and then from there, use that money to buy assets, 
cash generating assets. Buy an Uber, uh, buy trucks, uh, buy uh, spaza shops or buy small uh, supermarkets, um, buy up a funeral parlor, um, buy up a little hardware store, begin building property, um, begin farming, buy tractors, and then use the, the money you make from these ventures and from these assets to grow your stock fill and then build something bigger. That's how a lot of the Afrikaans businesses were built. And then from there, try and find other like-minded stock fells and then merge with them. If you've got a stock fell that's got 100,000, find another stock fell that has 50,000 or 100,000. <clears> Come together and merge your monies and merge your resources and then build from there. In time, you'll maybe have 20 stock fells that come together and raise maybe 20 million and have a whole range of assets and resources and people with skills. And that's how you then take over a chunk of the economy. That's how you play the game to win. I suggest you guys look up uh, Professor Muhammad Yunus's Grameen Bank of Bangladesh and then look up Sahara Pariwe, Pariwa in India by Subrata Roy. These are two great success stories of men who went and pulled money from poor people, took their little one rand, 10 rand, 20, 50 rands. They helped them to buy assets. They helped them to self-fund small businesses. And then from there, these people grew whatever they had into something respectable today. Just wanted to share my thoughts on this. And I look forward to hearing some of your thoughts as well. There's a lot of lack of education. And I hope that a lot of you guys, besides riding trends, and getting emotional and getting caught up by politicians and their lies. Begin reading and researching for yourself. The Ascent of Money by Neil Ferguson is a brilliant book. There's a whole lot of others as well that I just haven't listed here. Read up on Google. There's a lot of articles on banking. Investopedia is a great website to read about as well. Wikipedia has got a plethora of information about the Rothschilds, about the Medici family, about some of the big banking families in the world today. And then go to the South African Reserve Bank website. It's boring as hell, but you learn something. Go to the National Credit Regulator website. Read up on CFIs, Cooperative Financial Institutions. Read up on the history of AFGRI, of Clover, and a whole host of other companies in this country that came together because a group of people decided to come together and raise funds. Old Mutual in Cape Town was started by a small group. I think about 20 people that came together. And today, I think it's got probably over a trillion rand in assets and it operates in a couple of countries and it makes a lot of money. Just start and kick off. I wish Ntabuleng and her team a great success. And even if they fail at what they're trying to achieve now, I hope that they learn a lot in the process and I hope that they end up building something, even if it's an investment fund that can help them move forward. This is Peñuel the Black Pen. Have a great Saturday. Cheers.